class. Uh, big thanks to everyone who took the uh, self-test. Yeah, uh, for the benefit of anyone who, who missed the messages or has maybe come to the unit late, I posted a self-test survey on uh, a basic established uh, staffing practices. Yeah, which should be up on LMS. Just want to get a sense of roughly what your understanding is, where you're at, uh, what your intuitions about these things might be. Mm. We got 40 responses. Yeah, and so um, before uh, proceeding with the video, I recommend going back to the survey. Uh, the link should be on still on LMS and in the video description below, so you can revisit your original answers. Okay, let's go. Uh, formal structured interviews are more useful selection tools than informal interviews designed around each candidate's unique background. Class, what do you think? Uh, well, what many of you uh, thought about this was that it was uh, fake news, not actually true. Um, actually, class, it is uh, legit, definitely. The best evidence we have is that structured interviews are genuinely better at selecting good candidates than unstructured interviews. And in fact, they're more than double the value uh, for money for, for, for an organization class. I'll walk you through the evidence on this uh, in week five and also how to work out uh, the value for money for a certain uh, selection procedure. So yeah, class, this is uh, legit, uh, very legit, in fact. Now, here we have another question. Uh, question two, companies that screen job applicants for values perform better than companies that screen uh, job applicants for intelligence. Uh, and most of you said legit, and sorry to say, class, this is fake news. Yeah, super fake. So intelligence is by far the best predictor we have of future job performance. Uh, th there was a classic study that showed that the benefit of testing for intelligence uh, in selection in uh, it was the Philadelphia Police Department. Yeah, the benefit is $170 million over 10 years. That's the value it brings to the organization in higher quality policing. And that's setting aside all the issues with policing that's emerged over the past decade or so and, and, and has come to, to uh, mainstream attention. Yeah, so the predictive power of intelligence class is, I think, a genuinely shocking thing for people who are unaware of the evidence, which we will go through in week four. <coughs> I will say, in contrast, hiring people with the right values that align with the company is yeah, nice and all, but these people do not necessarily perform any better. And that's why selecting on values is actually considered bad practice. We'll get to this more later in the semester class. Mm. Now we come to question three. Uh, the Big Five model of personality is the most common form of personality assessment used in selection. And yeah, it's true. It really is uh, one of the most common forms. Uh, uh, three quarters of you got that right. Uh, the MBTI Myers-Briggs uh, Myers type inventory is still uh, a little too popular uh, considering the, the, the limited value it brings to organizations, which we'll save for week five. We'll get to that class. Next, question four. People should be hired based on their emotional intelligence rather than IQ. So here we have a nice even split with half of you saying, yeah, hire based on EQ. The other half saying, no, uh, yeah, IQ perhaps would be more useful. And uh, as you might predict now, the, ev the evidence is that this is fake news. Um, generally, what we see is after accounting for IQ, emotional intelligence contributes next to nothing to you know, valuable employee outcomes like sales performance. Yeah, EQ just doesn't add much, very little at all after accounting for IQ. Mm. More on this class when we get to week four. Next, question five. The number one reason for employee turnover, um, quitting, uh, uh, sorry, exiting in this case, is uh, in, in Australian businesses is 
a poor relationship with the supervisor and the manager. Uh, the majority believe that this is legit. That, that most people who do leave leave because their boss sucks, yeah, or some some conflict, ongoing conflict, persistent conflict with the boss. Perhaps uh, this is actually uh, fake news. So uh, the research we have tracking people's reasons for uh, uh, leaving their jobs or why people do end up leaving, they do rate. Uh, poor relationship with the manager highly, but it's not the highest, not even close. The highest class is lack of career progression opportunities. So people who leave tend to leave because they, they reckon they have hit a plateau and can't get any higher than this career-wise in that organization. Hence, they leave. Hmm, interesting. More on this in week 10. Next. Question six, big five conscientiousness is a better predictor of performance than IQ. Most of you said, yeah, sounds legit. Class, it's fake news. IQ reigns supreme. We will talk about this in weeks four and five. Mm. Oh, I should clarify. It's not that conscientious is not a predictor of performance. It just does not compete with IQ. Intelligence is really the ultimate predictor of a future performance as far as we can tell yeah next we we get the question seven class uh, integrity and honesty surveys which try to predict whether people are likely to steal behave unethically uh, uh, be absent from work uh, such surveys are useless for selection and practice because people lie anyway it is fake news uh, the answers were sort of evenly split, but yeah, class, um, these surveys work. And here we encounter one of the bizarre paradoxes of staffing. Class, integrity tests basically ask people if they're honest. Yeah, so it's like a personality test questionnaire with questions relating to honesty and sincerity, that sort of thing. Yeah. Now, the goal of this class is to catch people who are likely to engage in theft, bullying, uh, likely not to show up for work, so high levels of absenteeism, and generally other counterproductive work behavior. Yeah. Which are, of course, things that you don't want in your in your hire. So you want to select for people who don't do these things, especially in say retail, where theft can often be a big issue. Yeah. Just for example. Now you would think that asking people, hey, are you honest? Hey, are you sincere? Now, you're asking these people, uh, you're asking these questions to people who would generally lie and steal and hurt others. They would lie. They would say, yeah, oh, I'm honest, but really they're not. Yeah? Which, in which case, you would think these tests would be useless. Yeah? People are lying. Anyway, so how would this test predict who is likely to steal and so on? Now, class, the, the paradox here is that, yes, people do lie on these tests. Of course they do. If you've ever applied for a job, you've surely misrepresented your personality in some way. People do this. Yeah, let's, let's get real. Yeah. Nevertheless, these tests still predict who is likely to cheat, steal, and bully. Yeah. So yes, people do distort their answers, and nevertheless, the tests still work. You can lie on it, and it still catches the people likely to steal. Yeah. Uh, now, why is that the case? Uh, that's a paradox class that we will return to in a week five. So stay tuned. Yeah. This paradox of yes, people lie on personality tests and integrity tests. And yet they still predict performance. They still predict counterproductive workplace behaviors. It's a paradox, which we will explain soon enough. Now we move on to question eight. Employees who get a positive result on a drug test are less productive and uh, less reliable on average. Hmm. Now I know this class that the majority slightly thought this was fake news. Hate to break it to you, class. It's legit. 
<laughs> so a paper that followed the 4,000 job applicants in the states uh, into their jobs for one year, yeah, found that people who tested positive on a uh, a fairly broad range of drugs, uh, from cannabis on the low end to uh, uh, stronger drugs on the high end, had an absenteeism rate of 59%. Yeah, so if, if so, the people who tested positive for drugs were fifty nine percent more absent and forty seven percent more likely to get fired. Now, class, one thing, one caveat to bear in mind is that this study was conducted in nineteen ninety. It's an old study. What do the new studies say? No one's done them. No one has done a new study on this. So this is old evidence um, conducted before most of you were born. I don't know. Um, presumably. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, there is a need, of course, for new research on this. We don't know what the current state is. So if anyone's looking for an honors topic, yes, yeah, something to do for honors, here you go. Let's, uh, let's see if this still holds. And if it holds uh, over here, uh, not just in the states, yeah? Now, we get to question nine. Employees hired through referrals have lower turnover rates than employees hired through job postings. And this is legit. You, 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 most of you got this right, class, uh, and more on this in week nine. But yeah, generally, uh, employees who are hired based on word of mouth, connections, are more likely to stay than people who just see the job posting and apply We'll work through the trade-offs uh, between these two options, uh, referrals and job postings, when we get to week 9. Yes, this is legit. Now, week 10, uh, sorry, question 10. Uh, I asked if work simulations are widely regarded as the most useful and valid way to determine the strengths of a job candidate. Yeah, now this was overwhelmingly uh, uh, believed to be legit. Oh, class. No, 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 no. Fake news. Now, again, class, we have a staffing paradox here. Mm. We know that work simulations are pretty good at predicting future performance. So if you do well in a work simulation in a selection setting, you generally will perform well at your job. However, it is not very good at working out the specific strengths a job candidate has. Are they good at the communication side or more on, say, parts of the task side? Uh, work simulations can't really tell. We will work through this uh, when we get to week seven. Uh, but yeah, there is a, a, a fair bit of controversy over the use of these uh, work simulations, specifically assessment centers. Yeah, these are fairly popular in uh, recruitment for grad programs. And uh, yeah, there is a bit of, uh, of concern over the fact that yes, they predict future performance, but they kind of don't tell you what the job candidate is good at. So it's a bit. Uh, uh, tricky to work with. Again, more on that in week seven. So class, uh, I, I, I went through all these questions with you, not to like dunk on you that like, ooh, you don't know what these uh, staffing best practices are, but, but really rather to convey how counterintuitive a lot of the best practice uh, can be. It genuinely is counterintuitive. And that's what happens when you, when you let science lead the way, when you let evidence lead the way, you often get solutions that are like, huh, really? Okay. But often that is what works. Yeah. What does create value for the firm and relying solely on intuition can uh, ironically steer you the wrong way, especially in staffing. Yeah. So the goal is not to let go of your intuition entirely because clearly as we go through the unit, there will be bits where like you will have to exercise some discretion and make tough choices where there's no clear evidential guide. Yeah. But the goal is to supplement your in intuitions with what we do have is an existing evidence base so that you get the best of both worlds. Mm. And uh, class, all right, class, that's uh, all I have for you today. Uh, I look forward to uh, continuing this uh, journey into staffing with you over the uh, span of the semester. And if you have any questions, as always, just uh, send me an email and uh, yeah, stay in touch.